55 minutes. And, uh, You're ready. Okay. Well, my name is Chris Reedy, and we're here at the uh, 376 Bomb Group Association reunion, September 6, 2007. And can, if you could give us your name and when you were born and where you were born. Oh, <laughs> my name is Andrews, Charles Andrews. I don't have a middle name. <clears throat> I was born in Oxford, Wisconsin on June 5th of 1918. I'm a war baby from World War I. My dad didn't see me till I was six months old. He was in the service? He was in the, yeah, he was in the Signal Corps of the Army in the World War II. Mm -hmm. And World War I, yeah. As you grew up through to the Depression and, and the tail end of the Depression and uh, things were going on in Europe, things were going on in the Far East as well. Did you have an idea that the United States would be drawn into the conflict? Not necessarily, but I always had an urge to fly. Uh, years ago, the, the uh, Army at that time, Army Air Corps, had beautiful ads of pilots with their goggles on and uh, glamour pictures, you know. And the fact that they were paying <clears throat> at that time, $327 a month wages. Now, this is back in the late 39s and early 40s. And I was only making about $18 a week. And I thought, what a, what a good deal this would be if I could get in there. I'd love to, love to try to fly and make more money. Yeah. So when did you join the service? In, uh, well, I was married before the war. And uh, then the war came on, and uh, they wouldn't take uh, uh, married men into pilot training. And then they, I found out that they would take married men into pilot training if they waived their wives as dependents, which means that I had to go to pilot training with the same pay as the single pilots did. Uh, we got $50 a month plus $25 uh, flying pay. $75 a month we got, and I had to live for all through that with my wife, and she was with me through pilot training. So it got kind of belt tightening time then. Those were the poorest days of my life. Uh, we had a baby at that time, later, um, in my cadet training. It was rough. I can remember after each mess meal, that we had, I'd go down the tables and pick out what's left in oranges and apples and things like that, and I'd take them in, into my wife and anything that, because I could only see her at, on weekends. And she had some little humble place that she lived in. It was rough. I, were you ever tempted or uh, was it, did it ever come to a point where you thought, I'm just going to wash out? No, never, never. I was determined to make it. And classification in San Antonio was rough because they were, I suppose you've heard many men talk about the classification center where everybody that wanted to go into the training had to go through there and then you were classified as pilots, navigators, uh, gunners, engineers, whatever. And of course, everybody wanted to be pilots. But boy, they sure separated them out there. There were only a small fraction that made it to pilots. And then you had to go through another, through the training of pilots. And when you went in primary, then about half or better of those got washed out. And then each step along the way, uh, the guys were washed out. And I remember seeing guys sit down, and they were young men too, sit down ball like babies because they were rejected. No, it, it wasn't easy, but I was lucky, I guess. What do you think sustained you during that? What, what? Was, what sustained your morale during that period? Well, I had a wife to support, for one thing. I had my objectives in mind, which I was determined with, and um, I just kept at it, you know. I'm not afraid to study, and uh, I w I've always been uh, reasonably uh, educated, you might say. How big a part, if any, did patriotism play? Patriotism? Big part, of course. Um, I look at that, look back on that 
it scares me today when I see so much uh, anti-war uh, factions and so forth. Uh, and of course, those are good people that are anti-war. I don't hold it against them, but I hold against them their reasoning that if we're in a war, let's win it. And uh, uh, I was a, always have been a very, very strong patriot. Yeah. How long were you in pilot training? Pilot training, oh, uh, just about a year, almost a year. Yeah. And at the end of your training, where did you go from there? And where were you training, <coughs> I guess? Well, after you get your commission and you're declared a, ordered to be a pilot, uh, all you do is got your wings, but you've not, another, never, never have flown any combat aircraft. So then you have to go and transition to a larger aircraft. I went up to uh, Fort Worth, and I had to transition, transition into B-24s and fly them. And then after you uh, passed all those tests, and you, uh, I personally was up to Boise, Idaho. So, and then I was assigned my crew, <clears throat> and I get the crew together. I get my co-pilot first and everybody down the line. And, so that was my crew, and then we had to train as a crew. It's quite a, it's quite an interesting training. Well, as the, as the pilot, you're kind of the, you were the team captain, I guess. Well, you're the head of the crew. You know, they're, you're their responsibility, um, and it's it's all right, but you have to be able to bear that responsibility, and it's very important because. Later in combat, their lives depended on you, you know, and uh, uh, anybody that takes their responsibility seriously has to be a good pilot. You know, to... How did you interact with your crew? What were relations like? Great. Uh, I was much older than most of them were in their 18s and 19s. I was 24. They called me Pop. <laughs> I was so old. At, uh, but I loved them. I loved the boys. I lost some of them, and I'll never forget them. But uh, that's, that's history, you know. When you first formed your crew, and you knew the anticipation was you're going to be shipped overseas, did you know you were going to Europe at that time? No, you never know where you're going to go. Uh, all you do, is, you know, is you wait for orders, and uh, they assign you where they need you. That's all. And uh, so you, you don't, you get a suspicion when you're shipped out to the East Coast, for example, that you're going to Europe, but uh, you don't really know. You know. Did you have a preference one way or the other? Not really. Uh, I don't ever remember having a preference. I just learned that I had to take orders, that's all. You know, I had to go where you went, where you were ordered. Can you describe the flight from the United States over to, the, over to Italy or wherever you were based <laughs> first? I didn't fly over there. See, uh, they didn't have plane, uh, ha they had more pilots coming through than they did airplanes. So uh, the whole crew from, from Boise, we didn't fly over there. Uh, we got to the, uh, the East Coast, and then we went down to Norfolk, and we were shipped out on, on ships. And uh, it was interesting in the fact that uh, it was a, a ship that was loaded with um, Jamaican soldiers. And uh, they were just, they out, uh, outnumbered us greatly, and so they cooked all the meals, which we couldn't eat, and, <laughs> and things like that. But it was a two-week uh, two voyage from um, Norfolk over to Oran, which is in Algeria. And uh, uh, then we were shipped on to Naples. And then from Naples, we were shipped on to uh, where we were assigned. And then we were all broken up to different outfits in, in Italy. Mm -hmm. What time was that? What, what year? And that was about July of '44 sometime in July of 44. By that time, the 376 really kind of led the way for the other units of the, the 15th. Did you know that you were going into a unit that had a pretty good history? No. No, not at all. Didn't know anything about them. 
In fact, uh, on our way over there, uh, that was all uh, confidential information. You didn't know where all those bases were there or anything. And when I got to 376, at first, I didn't even know where it was. You know, it's, it was way down in the heel of the boot. But there were four, four squadrons down there, uh, four groups down there, and it's a 47th wing. And of course, you're just a little incident in one of the groups, or one of the squadrons. You know. Can you describe your introduction to the unit, meeting with the old hands and being the new the new crew? No, I don't remember any of that. I know when I assigned my first mission, they had the policy in our group that uh, you'd fly your first two missions with a, an experienced co-pilot. So I flew my first two missions with, um, with a, another co-pilot. I have a list of my missions I brought here if you want me to go over it or anything. Well, can you describe some of the, the highlights of maybe your first mission, what your feelings were like, and then as you became more experienced, did your attitude change? Well, your attitude changes when you get shot at, believe me. Uh, that's the biggest thing. I, I didn't get hit on my first two missions. My second mission was to the Toulon, France, uh, in preparation for the invasion of southern France. <clears throat> and then I went back, I think, may I get that yes, information? Yes, certainly. And um, then I went back uh, two or three missions later, back to Toulon. And that was interesting because it, um, the, the ships for the invasion were off the harbor there, um, far enough out that you couldn't see them from the, from the uh, land. But, oh, a huge, big invasion fleet, aircraft carriers and uh, war, war, all kinds of warships, cruisers and battleships and landing ships and everything under the sun. And it's very interesting to see them. Just covered a wide area, because when you're at 25,000, you can see a long ways off. And you saw that coming when you look down from your plane and you see their armada mm -hmm. that's headed their way. Did you feel any amount of pity for the Germans? Never. I never had any pity for them. Uh, no, they were our enemy, and um, they, they were the they were the Germans. You know, of course, uh, we had by that time Italy had had uh, surrendered, and then uh, so they they were. I don't know, we didn't look upon them as either enemies or any too friendly either, uh, just kind of in between. Did you have any uh, interaction with the Italian people? Not too much, not too much. I couldn't do too, too much activity. I was a married man then, you know, and uh, I'd go to town to look around when you can and so forth, but, uh, um, oh, I felt sorry for a lot of them, you know, they were... Uh, Kids were always asking you for candy and things like that. And guys were out trying to proposition you for their sisters and this sort of thing. But it um, it was interesting. It was an education, really, to uh, to see all that and you know, be a part of it. You know. <clears throat> Can you describe? Uh, were all your missions high altitude? Kind of strategic or interdiction bombing missions? Well, yeah, they were all high altitude except one that I can remember. Uh, we had had orders just before the invasion of Greece. The, the, the British invaded Greece to drive the Germans out, and there were a bunch of 109s on the, on the Kalamaki Airdrome in Athens. And we were supposed to, well, we were just across the drink from, from Greece. It wasn't. We only had a bomb from about 10,000 or something like that. And I remember seeing the bombs from the previous, the guy, the outfit ahead of us hitting the, the runway there. We blew up a lot of them. There were some of the 109s that were taken off when we were bombing. So, And we got some of them, too. So it was interesting. But all of the rest were, were up at 25, 26, 24,000 in that area. What uh, what posed more of a difficulty for you, flak or enemy fighters? Well, at our stage, because I bombed Ploesti 
I don't know, some of my first missions. And uh, of course, we were knocking out the gas there in Ploesti. But it was flak that was our biggest, as far as I was concerned. I, I only had a, oh, a couple opportunities to see any enemy fighters. But the flak was a dangerous thing. I still have a piece in my leg. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it was deadly. Most of it was 88. But uh, I don't know, the early part of 45, we were going up to Vienna a lot. They were using 105s. And you could tell the difference when they went off because their burst was much bigger and uh, it was a very deadly shell. And the 105s were more dangerous than the 88s. Yeah. The 88 is universally known as yeah. the, uh, the German gun. Mm -hmm. I've talked yeah. to a lot of veterans and, oh, we got hit by 88s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they were using those in tanks and, uh, and the aircraft. Yeah. And, uh, so when they come through the 105s, I, th I don't know, I think they use some of those on the ground too, but I'm not sure about that. But we sure got them. Yeah. Yeah. Was it frustrating that, you know, flak was this impersonal, you couldn't necessarily hit it back and yet it was hitting away at yeah. you? It's hard to describe it. You know, they got so smart in some missions and some of the targets, not all, but some of the targets they put down what they called a barrage in which they, they knew what altitude we were at and they knew where we were going because once you get to the IP, you can't swerve. you got to go straight. And they would put up a barrage and we'd have to fly, fly into it with the, all these shells going off. In fact, I can remember in briefing on some missions that i look around and I'd wonder who's the poor devil that's not going to make it back tonight, you know. Uh, it's interesting, yeah. but that's the way we felt, you know. Was there ever, I guess as the war was nearing its end, did it get to a point where you could feel the defenses slacking, or was it horrible all the way to the very end? Well, that's a good question. Um, see, when the, where we were in Italy, the Germans were pushing up from, from Greece, because the British invaded there, and then the Russians were coming in also. And they were pushing the German army up out through the Balkans there. And they were taking all their anti-aircraft guns with them. So when they got up to, <coughs> to the um, Vienna area, and they had some oil refineries and uh, a lot of targets up there, they had a lot of guns up there. And they were really, really firing them. And they were good with them. They, uh, they shot down a lot of, lot of airplanes, a lot of airplanes. When you were given your targets, you know, were, how much detail were you told about the targets and did you feel better going after like an aerodrome or a military target? Like you, you got to hit back at the source. Well, you were always glad to hit them, but it didn't matter which because uh, most of them were defended. Uh, the defense was very different, a lot of them. Sometimes if we just had a bridge or something like that to knock out, it wouldn't be as well defended to say it. An oil plane or a Brenner Pass or up near Vienna with all the, the uh, rail lines and all the refineries and things. Uh, the more dangerous the target, of course, uh, to the Germans, the more guns they had there. You know. Did you... Uh you had mentioned the Russians were coming up or pushing the Germans out, and their air forces were active as well, but theirs was more tactical than strategic. Mm -hmm. um, was there any animosity, or did you ever actually see any Red Army aircraft on your missions? I, I never saw a Red Army aircraft. I ran into some Red Army uh, um, troops you know, with a red star on, but they were in Yugoslavia. And, uh, uh, no, I never saw any regular Soviet troops. Yeah. Did you, uh, you, you flew the 24 throughout, throughout the war? Yes, mm -hmm. and solely the 24. Yeah. We had different models, but uh, yeah, they were all 24. What kind of, uh, I guess, virtues and vices 
did the 24 have? Well, I liked the 24. I Later in life, I, I flew some B-17s, but I still liked the B-24 better. It was faster than the B-17. It could, uh, uh, it could carry a bigger load, but we couldn't, we didn't bomb as high as they did. They, they were about three to 5,000 feet above us on bombings, uh, B-17s were. But they were in the same boat we were. They got shot at too, you know, all in the same boat. Yeah. Um, when you flew through that box of, that barrage of flak, um, how aware were you as you flew through, through that of your ship getting hit? Could you feel it shudder? No. Uh, the only <clears throat> one I ever felt was when it went right alongside of my, blew up, blew right alongside of my ship and uh, killed my co-pilot. And uh, I felt that one, but it was so, so close that uh, you couldn't help to see. I wasn't, I had to flying on another aircraft and I had to keep flying formation. And uh, so I only saw him hit when out of my peripheral vision. But uh, it's hard rending to, to go through it because that shrapnel is very, very powerful. It's, it's surprising. I had a mission where the shrapnel went through one of my props. Well, uh, the hub of those props were about that big and round. They were made out of chrome molybdenum, chrome molybdenum steel, and it took a hunk out <laughs> like that out of, out of the prop. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's powerful stuff. You said you were lead, the lead plane in many formations. Can you describe what that entailed? Well, it entails, <clears throat> I didn't have that many missions just toward the end of the war, but um, it entails getting your group, your, your squadron together, and uh, you have either from six to maybe eight or nine, maybe not even six, sometimes maybe only four planes in V's all the way, and after takeoff, you have to fly out, uh, figure out how long you have to fly out and turn to come back, and come back over your airfield, and all of the planes have to be in position when you come back over your own airfield, and then, you're, then you go out on, on your course. But um, you have the responsibility for all those men in the, in the, whole, the whole group. I know one mission I had where there was a bogey coming up, and I heard, I couldn't see it. You can't see back in an airplane, but I was advised there was a B-24 trying to join our formation. Well, we had heard word that, you know, the Germans had taken some of those aircraft that had been shot down, and they put them back into action, and they'd get into a formation and all of a sudden, the guns would swing around, and he'd shoot down several airplanes, you know. So as soon as I found out this, I ordered every man in the, my flight to keep their, every gun we had on that ship. And at that time, I could see the ship because he was pulling in. And those guys wouldn't dare have shoved their, any gun toward us. Or they would had gunfire from every one of our ships, as I said. Don't fire unless you see them swinging guns toward us. Mm -hmm. And uh, they never did. They kept them out, and they knew better. <laughs> but uh, no, you have the responsibility for them. You get guys that have questions and so forth, but you, your navigator has to navigate you properly, and your bombardier has to uh, release the bombs properly and so forth. And, uh, then you've got to lead them back, you know. It's a responsibility. Was your bombardier then, at that point, in charge of like signaling? Okay. Oh yeah, when Here's... you led, yeah, your bombardier. Otherwise, if you were just uh, in the formation, you dropped the bombardier. All he had to do was flick a switch when he saw the bombs dropping out of the lead aircraft, so they would all uh, be symmetrical and, and dropping. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, all of the bombardiers in the other than the lead ship, 
they used to look to look through their bomb site, but they would still drop on the lead ship, and uh, it was easy for them. Yeah. Was the twenty four? You know, the United States stuck with precision bombing. Mm -hmm. uh, the British went to area bombing, but mm -hmm. we with the Norden bomb site and daylight bombing, especially, was very costly. Do you think it was the precision bombing was effective, and, and was it worthwhile? Well, I think it was. We knocked out Ploesti and uh, so many bridges and factories and some targets we had. Uh, it's, I bombed in every country in southern Europe, from, from all the way from uh, France and Germany, Austria, Italy, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Hungary. Romania and Greece. The only one I didn't bomb was uh, Albania. I've flown over it several times, but I never bombed there. No you may target. not have had anything there worth bombing. <laughs> no, there wasn't any any worthwhile target. But coming back from Ploesti, we had a route route right over Albania, and uh, I remember my rear turret gunner hollered at me, "Jays," he says. That guy in back of us just lost his tail. Uh, he got hit by a, just a lone shot that knocked the tail off the ship, and the B-24 went down. But uh, Albania, no, they, there was nothing there. But we did cost us an airplane. Yeah. Yeah. You described the personal loss that you felt with your co-pilot, but also within your bomb group and within your squadron, you had probably losses after each mission. How did the men, I guess, deal with that? I don't know. We handled it. Uh, it was part of war. Uh, you know that you were, you were risking your life, but we always think that, well, you're going to make it through, see. Uh, I got sprayed with some with my co-pilot got killed, and uh, when I got back, I had got permission to fly over to the nearest base with, his, with him to try to get him to some medical attention. But uh, he was hit badly. He, uh, we found out later he had one big one that went through his, his, his uh, black vest, and the other one cut off his jugular vein, and a couple shots cut off a couple of fingers. And then he was sprayed, and then I got a whole bunch of little ones in the side of me. But I didn't even know it. <laughs> was your adrenaline I was, so, that? I was so busy, yeah. And I landed at the first base south of the bomb line, and uh, I had the ambulance waiting for me, and uh, they took him out, but they said he was dead. Mm -hmm. The only one thing I could do was just fly back to my base and... and uh, I was assigned another pilot, so that's that's all it was. Yeah. You, know? you can't do anything about it. The guy's dead. He's dead. You know, hard part is packing up his stuff and sending it home and so forth. You know, that's hard. He's just a young kid, big, strapping, good-looking kid from Kansas. I have his picture here. Um, <clears throat> We've talked to, or I've talked to a lot of veterans of all branches of service and, you know, talk to them if they envied the guys in the tanks or the guys in the planes and vice versa. And generally, they're, they were in their branch of service, they accepted it, and they were happy, and they didn't want to be that other guy. <laughs> Did you ever long to be a guy in the foxhole, or were you happy in Not your really, no. I was... I was enjoying flying. I, I loved to fly. Uh, we had a guy at one time, one of the engineers on the ground that thought that it was so nice if the guys flew 50 missions, they could go home. And so they put him on a mission and he got shot down. <laughs> so that's the way things go, you know. There's nothing sure in this life. Uh, it's rough. Mm -hmm. When you were getting ready for your flight, as a pilot, you had to consider, you probably had a flight briefing and steps leading up to, can you take us through 
maybe a, a day as far as a mission, getting ready for a mission? Well, the day you got up, it was dark, I'll tell you that. And then, of course, you had to get dressed, go over to the mess hall, and after the mess hall, there were trucks waiting to take you down to the line, or to briefing first. And the briefing was for the officers and the airmen. And, of course, the only, um, it was just a, a tent that had an aisle down the middle, and then each side, the pilot and his co-pilot, his navigator, bombardier sitting there, and each crew that way. And uh, you just uh, listened to what the target was, because you wouldn't know until you sat there. And uh, the maps were all covered up until everybody got in, and then uh, there was a curtain, and then we knew where we were. And of course, it was one of the noted rough targets. There'd be a lot of size around and, and sort of thing, but we knew we had to do it. You know, there was no question about it. I never saw a man ever turn back. Uh, never. They all, all went right through. And you had your briefing, and then oh, yeah. the, did the enlisted men have a separate briefing, or yeah. were they in? Mm -hmm. the gunners and the, and the uh, mechanic, the uh, crew chief, which is a, was the engine, ship engineer. And um, then the, um, each one had a turret, you know, because you had your nose turret, your top turret, the belly turret, and the, and the rear turret. So, no, they were um, briefed on targets and possible possibilities of uh, enemy fire and so forth, those sort of things. Mm -hmm. But they knew their job, too, you know. They had been trained. They were good men, good Boys, actually. <laughs> Boys that became men, did you, did you notice a change among your crew? Well, you know, I've always told people the fact that as far as I was concerned, my crew came over as boys, but went back as men for what they had had to go through, you know, because they had to go through the same thing we did, you know. There's no discrimination on flak. You know, and getting shot down, they got to go down too, you know. We're all together on that. You don't have a, a chance to discriminate at all, you know. Except as a pilot, you, you kind of look after them, you know. And if the situation arises where you had to bail out, you'd want to be the last one out so that they all got out and so forth. But I never did bail out. I never had to bail out. Mm -hmm. What was your, if you pick a moment where you were the most frightened, what would that be? Oh, <laughs> most frightened? Well, I was frightened quite a few times, but always when you're flying in and those shots, those flak is going off, it's very terrifying. But if you're, if you're leading, it's terrifying. And if you're flying with, on somebody, in other words, flying on somebody's wing, you've got to watch them. You know, you, you're that ship. You can't turn away and look around and, and do anything. You're watching that ship every second of the way because you never know if something might hit him. And he might swerve something, too, and uh, especially in times where we've had to get into some bad weather on the way to the target where formations just dispersed. You couldn't see each other. Um, and... You, the, even the ship you were flying on disappeared. And uh, I remember on one mission where I looked up and, well, out of my peripheral vision, I could see a wheel right above me. Now it's not that far. Huge, big wheel. Well, the landing wheels on a B-24, they go up on the outside. They don't go in, they go out. And it's, they only have one wheel, and it's a big one. And, uh, boy, I swerved in a hurry, you know, get out from underneath them, and uh, there was a number of different aircraft that went down that, that flew together that day, and we never got to the target. You don't even get credit for the mission. <laughs> yeah. What was your relationship, if any, uh, as far as your fighter escort? Pretty good, really. Uh, later, anyway. Um, I don't remember seeing a whole lot on some of the earlier missions, but later, mostly 51s. Um, 
we had that uh, black squadron, that black group, a lot. As I, mm -hmm. I got to know some of those guys in rest camp. They're really fine chaps. They're well educated. They're well trained. They're darn good pilots, you know. But we also had some 38s would fly hot top cover for. And I think once or twice we might have even seen some 47s, but mostly 51s and then 38s, and that's what it was. Our previous person we interviewed talked highly of the uh, Tuskegee men. That yeah, the Tuskegee cover. men, yeah, mm -hmm. very highly. Uh, like I say, they, um, oh, I could tell you incidents, but I'm not going to, but anyway, we, we were well glad to have them tell you that. When you see them up above, you know they were there for your protection, you know, and all they had to do was call them in. And, but they were watching for Germans, you know, at that time. Do you think, from your perspective, uh, you came from Wisconsin, am I mm -hmm. right? You were yeah. a northern, kind of a northern boy. Did you detect any kind of racial tension if you had any southern crew members and then also the Tuskegee men flying cover for you? Or did you notice a change in perception once it was proved that these men could do their job and do it well? I think we all honored all the servicemen. Each one had their job to do. Um, there was a, a, a black uh, uh, trucking company that was around our area in San Pancrazio there that we used to see a lot. And those guys, uh, well, Boy, they really handle those, those big trucks, you know. Boy, they go through those little narrow streets and they only had about that much on each side. And they'd go barreling through them. And uh, they were good drivers, too. So, no, I didn't have any, any uh, dislike for them. Or they were just doing their job like everybody else. You know? They were good at it. As the war wound down, can you tell us about the end of the war, where you were, and, and what your feelings were? Well, the end of the war came. You see, we were so far south in the heel of the boot that the, the, what we call the bomb line, that's where as far as it was safe to, uh, there weren't any Germans south of that border, the bomb line. It was going so far north that we weren't as effective down there, and uh, so they sent the 376 home, you see. And everybody that didn't get their, hadn't had their 50 missions in, was stayed and had to go to another group. And I was one of them. And so I was assigned to the 454th bomb group up near uh, Cherignola, at least up near the spur of the boot. And I, I got up there, I was a captain at that time. And, they signed me to a squadron, and I outranked the squadron commander, and they asked me if I wanted to take the squadron, and I said, no, I want to fly a couple missions and go home. <laughs> Tail in Charlie, I don't care what it was. But anyway, I did fly two missions out of uh, 454 there, and then the war ended. But a lot of guys up there, they got drunk the night uh, they heard. I went to church myself. I was thankful because of what I went through and so forth. I was uh, very thankful, very thankful. After the war, what did you do? What happened to you? Well, I, I stayed active as long as I could. I wanted to keep flying. And uh, so I was, I was assigned out to um, San Bernardino Army Airfield. And I was assigned an assistant operations officer. And I had a chance to fly a lot of different airplanes out there. I checked out and everything. I, I flew C-47s and C-46s and, uh, gee, since after the war. Oh, I flew B-17, I flew B-25, B-26s. Uh, I flew uh, P-40, P-47s. And I ended up, I flew P, uh, P, what was called P-80s before the start. present day Jet pilots were born back in the 50s. I flew jet planes, you know, and uh, it's a thrill to fly those, of mm -hmm. course, and uh, it's a fun. How long did you stay in the service then? Well, I stayed active in the reserve <clears throat> all my life. Well, well, for I flew till I was 50 years old. I ended up as commander here in Milwaukee in this group. It 
Mitchell Field there. And it was a, uh, the uh, 933rd Troop Carrier Group. And I had a good group. Uh, I had about 850 men. Uh, I got promoted to colonel at that time because I had the group command. You know, and, but that's been a long time ago, too. I retired in uh, 1968. I, was, I got my uh, colonelcy in 65, so I've been a full colonel for, <laughs> since 1965. And that's before you gents were born. <laughs> Just barely. This barely. <laughs> uh, what? How would you characterize the post-war era? The the Air Force became its own service in 1947. 47, yeah. And mm -hmm. what was the what was it like to be an Air Force officer at that time? Well, um, frankly, at that time I got quite a bit of publicity because I was a commander down here, and even before that, uh, I. If they had a parade, I live up in Fond du Lac, about 65 miles north of here. If they were having a parade or something like that, I'd, I'd bring some planes and fly over the parade for them, you know, and whatever I was flying at that time. And uh, So I got a certain amount of publicity, but that disappeared many, many years ago. I, I didn't get any publicity, and I didn't seek any. I didn't want any. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know. I thought you were going to asked me about a mission that I flew where I was shot down. Oh, and I didn't know. Dave didn't prep me, so tell me. Well, this was quite a mission. It was to Vienna, to marshalling, or the, um, we had a lot of targets around Vienna. New Spearbaum, Moose, New Spearbaum which is a suburb of Vienna, had oil tanks, and then there was um, uh, Wiener Neustadt, which is Vienna, new city. Uh, they had a lot of targets around that. And uh, I, uh, the first time I was up there, and I, uh, I didn't realize because that was my first mission to uh, Vienna. But I was in the, um, I was just flying on somebody else's wing, and uh, I. The, my crewman called back and said my number four engine was on fire. So, of course, I had lost some to on fire before. So I, you just feather them and you have a fire extinguisher with one shot out of it. But it puts the fire out anyway, but you got to feather the prop. You know? But it didn't bother me to be on three engines because I came back from Ploesti on two missions on three engines. But... Um, just rolling off the target when I was checking my instruments, the oil pressure was going down on number three engine, which is the one, first one on the right. And uh, boy, it was going down fast. And if you don't feather it before it gets the oil pressure gets down, you can't feather it. And then it would be, it would be terrible. So I let it go down as far as I could, the oil pressure that is, and then I feathered it. Larry well, was flying on two in engines on the left side. And uh, you have no idea how it is to keep an aircraft flying with. If you keep the airplane straight, you can't go straight. Level, I should say. You can't go straight. So I had to, I had to fly at about angle like this to go straight. And so uh, and I. I had to start to get down low because our oxygen was shot out, as well as the hydraulic line. And so I got down as fast as I could, and then flying like this and trying to keep ahead, there's all of my co-pilot and I could do to keep the plane going straight. But uh, this took quite a while because, you know, we're a long way from home. But anyway, I remember in briefing they had told us that there's this island off the coast of Yugoslavia called Vis, V-I-S, and that there was a, an emergency landing strip there because that was Tito's army was based out there on that island. It was a, one of their big bases. And so I thought, well, I'm still going to get back to our base on those two engines. I was determined, but I had to go pretty close to there on the way back and I had to cross the Adriatic Sea. 
and I was afraid that I couldn't make it across the Adriatic Sea. So I made up my mind I was going to land there. So I had my navigator give us a steer to the island. <coughs> and I was great relieved that I had made that decision. I was happy with myself. But as far as the crew is concerned, they had to pump down the wheels. We had no oil pressure. Oh, and I don't know how many of the guys worked on it. It's a job. They got a lever. They got to work back and forth and back and forth to finally get the wheels down and locked and then get the flaps down and locked. And the engineer couldn't do it by himself. His arm would get sore with it, so they had to share those tasks. But they finally got them down, and I was getting pretty close to the island. But anyway, I uh, got to the point where I could see the island and see the airstrip there. And so I turned in to land, and I could see there was a B-24 at the end of this one. It was just a little bitty strip. There wasn't even 3,300 feet, you know. Well, I had dumped all my guns, everything I told the engineer, throw out anything that wasn't nailed down, it was as light as possible. But anyway, I started in, and I saw this B-24 at the end. Well, that cut the runway short for me in the first place, you know. But then I just coming in to see the, the, the uh, first part of the runway in some Italian uh, uh, cargo craft pulled out on the runway right in front of me. And then I knew I was going to crash. I had no alternative. I've only had the two engines. I couldn't possibly go down. I mean, go around or anything. I, I, I was committed to land there, and I knew I couldn't make a normal landing in that length of time because I had to go over the, the one plane and then try to stop before the other. So I couldn't have possibly have done it. So I made up my mind that when I hit the ground, I warned the guys I was going to try and break the nose wheel off. And um, so I was going around, I was going fairly fast because I didn't want to stall out with just those two engines both on the same side. Remember, that's, that's, not, that's not good. But anyway, uh, when I hit, I was going around 130 miles an hour. And you know, there's uh, that aircraft at that time weighed about 25 tons. You know, it's around 50,000 pounds. So mm -hmm. you get that much energy going it takes a lot to stop it. So I tried to break the nose wheel. But then it, the, the runway was cut in an old vineyard there, and they had irrigation uh, dugouts along, you know, irrigation ditches, which I couldn't see. And my left wheel uh, hit the irrigation ditch. And uh, I'm the only guy that ever rolled over a B-24, because it went right over, upside down. I have pictures of it here if you want to see them. But anyway, that came and, of course, it stunned all of us, you know. And uh, the um, next thing I can remember, the, I, was, I was trapped in there. I, I couldn't move anything but my one hand. And the, uh, the engine, those engines were run on magnetos. And, that one engine was still running. It didn't have a prop on it or anything, and it was upside down and everything, but it was getting gas, and it was big, 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 big. And I thought, oh, Jesus, if this thing starts on fire, we're all going to go. But I knew that some of the guys were alive that were in the front with me. But eventually, over a period of time, they got them all out. I was the last one to come out because I was way down the bottom. I can show you the pictures there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, there's a British field hospital there. And those guys took us up to the field hospital. And uh, they told me that the one guy, he was killed on instantly. My one, uh, he was my rear turret gunner. And then I got up to the hospital. I was the last one to get up there. <coughs> and then I was told that. Uh, Two of the guys were pretty in bad shape, and I went to look at them because I could, I could walk, I could hobble anyway, and I went to see them. 
one guy was, his face was gone. He must have gone head first into them. He was in the back, you know, in the three guys in the back of the ship in their crash position, but when the tail went over, it threw him, you know. His face was missing, and uh, but I knew who it was. Young kid from Pennsylvania, he was my radio operator. Mm -hmm. And the other one was my nose turret gunner. And he had, uh, he had sustained broken ribs, punctured lungs, and such thing. He was, he was out of it. But the rest of the guys, others, and a couple of broken bones and bruises and all, we, we actually, there were seven of us that survived that crash. And then they sent a, a, a Looney Bird of C-47 over from 15th Air Force headquarters, which they supplied them with supplies and so forth. They had a plane going back and forth there. And uh, so I sent all my crewmen that I could over there, but this one British doctor says, don't, don't try to fly that guy with a punctured lung, he's going to die. So I stayed there with him on the island, and uh, I think it was either the next day or the day after, I woke up and went over to see him, and they told me he had died during the night, so I lost three men in that crash. Mm. And, uh, I really felt bad about that, you know, losing those guys. Just young fellas. But I eventually made my way back, and I ended up in the hospital in Barrie, Italy, and uh, then to, um, well, my missions continued. They sent us to a rest camp after we got all healed up, and mm -hmm. I went back and had to fly the rest of my missions. But I, I think never have forgot him. Uh, talking with the other gentleman who was also a pilot, um, Paul Ross, talked about ditching into the water. And it sounds innocuous, but he said four of the guys drowned. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, either way, I mean, you did your, the best you could to land it there. If you'd have gone in the drink, yeah. well, it could have turned out even worse. You could have lost your whole crew. So. Yeah, I know it. I know it. I, I thank God for that. And like with my co-pilot, I wonder, why did he get killed instead of me? You know? mm -hmm. And you'll never know, and no use worrying about it. But you can't. Every day of my life, I've thought about those guys. Yeah. I still do. I went back to see their folks, and I told them how they died and um, what I thought of them and so forth. And they were so appreciative of it, you know. It's, it's hard. It's really hard. Well, you bore that as a 24, 25-year-old to take that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. can't imagine I could at 40 years old. So, Well, when you have to do it and it's your job and your duty, you do it. Mm -hmm. with you. you don't think about that things. You don't try to be a... I got awarded a silver star for that mission. I never wore my silver star. In my whole life, I never wore it. I wore my other medals, but I never wore the silver star. Yeah. I understand why. I have one at home, because I was awarded one, you know, but I never have worn it. I don't know, maybe I'm screwy or something. No, not at all. Charlie, thank you for taking the time well, to meet with us. I appreciate it. Yeah, I know you're way over time. Oh, we're just, it's just a tape issue. We're running out of tape, so we'll, oh, yeah? we'll wrap up here and and meet you here in a little bit. But thank you so much. Yeah, for, well, we've got a microphone on you, Charlie. We'll